Hi, I'm Nisha DeGaring, host of Good Things Utah, and I've been a longtime supporter of Todd's Belief Cast. I hope you find inspiration in the courageous stories shared by the amazing people Todd features on his show. The guests serve as shoulders for us to stand on, allowing us to see a little further and cultivate belief in oneself. Remember, you have the dignity and power to change. I encourage you to keep striving and believing in yourself. Enjoy today's podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you for making this an amazing experience for me. So many people are tuning in and listening and sharing. I love you guys. I can't tell you how much it means that you believe in me to be able to support this. Um, it wouldn't be possible without my sponsors. I want to thank all my sponsors. You guys are truly the best. The music you heard at the beginning and at the end of this podcast is by my good friend Paul Cardall. He uh, is a you know, an award-winning pianist and he has a, his own amazing story, but I love him and thank you, Paul, for, for being so kind and letting us use your music. It really brings a beautiful tone to this. And again, to all you guys tuning in and sharing, thank you. And the guests I have on my show are just fantastic, amazing people. I really believe people are astonishing. And I really mean that. I don't just say that uh, lightly. I really believe everyone's astonishing on so many levels. And today's going to be no different. Today we're joined by Katie Harrison. Katie, thanks for being here. Thanks, Todd. Yeah. So excited to be here. Congratulations. This is a year clean and sober. Yes, it is. Today, April Two day. 1st. It's yep. not an April Fool's joke. Nope, it's it's for real. It's for real. So congratulations. Thank I'm really you so proud much. of you. Thank you, Todd. I've been um, fortunate enough to be a part of your journey here at Wasatch Recovery. Um, Katie came through our program here and um, really struggled like a lot of people do when they first get here, but then had a couple key moments what started to flip in her own mind that she can do hard things and to watch her kind of just run with that. It's been <laughs> so cool. And um, you really have an amazing, at times, very traumatic story. And our listeners are going to really benefit so much from this. And so, Katie, um, why don't we start off with tell us where you grew up and maybe a little bit, a little bit about your childhood. Okay. Um, I grew up... I was born in Washington, D.C., but um, moved shortly after to Southern California, um, where we, my sister and my mom and I are basically what I would call my family. Okay. Um, my my real dad um, left our family when I was four years old for another family. So, okay. um, so I really struggled with that early on as far as like the abandonment and I recall um with my mom's help that there was a, a year of school where I uh would call her every single day like during yeah the day and say like I'm sick come pick me up mm. because I was so worried that like she yeah. was gonna leave me too oh, so it wow. all started really really young with feeling like just sort of I don't know just something wasn't wasn't right and yeah, the world felt unsafe yeah. yeah and my dad really had you know he he tried to sort of be a part of my life for a little while but it got less and less and less you know from that point on um but growing up in, with my mom and my sister it was it was really good but you know my mom was a single parent and she had to drive like an hour to LA from where we lived in the valley to uh, work every day so she was gone long hours and things like that so my sister sort of um she's nine years older than me became a little mm. bit of a you know a mom figure too yeah, sure yeah in that situation um but we were really happy and um i mean that that was all really fine um then i moved to utah when my mom married uh, my stepdad and that was probably like when I was like in my early teens and he was just sort of a, like one of those red personalities, really narcissistic, really controlling. Yeah. He would be like one of those where, you know, we had like a, a housekeeper come like, you know, every couple of weeks and he would do the white glove thing. Like, 
is this what what is this you know oh, and wow. so very very um just a hard person to deal with um so there was definitely like a lot of abuse there as far as like verbally and emotionally and keeping uh you kind of put down a lot not feeling like you're you know good enough and right things like that um so this happened, you know, you were what, like 12, between the ages of 12 and 16, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, was he abusive to you as well, or is he just really just tough on you? Um, there was there was definitely abuse um, as far as, like, especially I keep thinking back to this one um, situation where there was, um, I had, he had gotten me a job somewhere when I was really young. And, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this is hard to talk about sometimes, um, sure. but it was definitely not a time where you should be working yet because you're just, you know, you're just young. I think I was you're just barely 13 or something yeah. mm -hmm. and he had some connection, um, to the place that I worked to get me a job. And so I worked and it was fun and everything. And then. One uh, day when I was there, uh, the there was a manager type figure or someone that was older than me. Like I, I'm pretty sure the the guy was 16 or uh, so, and he had uh, trapped me into the bathroom and mm. basically sexually assaulted me, and oh, wow. I was really scared. I ended up. Yeah. getting away but I didn't really know kind of like what to do with that that was and I ended up telling someone at work and then they told you know the the somebody higher up than that and I mean the the guy was fired or whatnot but yeah. it was really really like I just felt really out of control you know yeah and um, I went home and told my stepdad what had happened because, you know, they were going to be calling later and yeah. talking about it. And he basically told me that, like, I shouldn't tell my mom because she would think that I was a slut or that oh, I was wow. um, asking for it. And so I kind of just went on with this like really heavy secret you know kind of just like holding on mm -hmm. to my heart and then I just started feeling like that you know like I guess I I guess I did do this you know like this was my fault and so you started blaming yourself exactly which is unfortunate I think it's pretty common for someone to start doing that because you know I work with a lot of people who've gone through what you've been through and yeah I think one of the things they start blaming themselves on some level, but again, you know, you were 13, yeah. you, were, you were a child, I know, you know, and you didn't know obviously what was going on and right. basically hopeless in that scenario. Exactly. Wow. And so at that point then, you know, my stepdad in his um, kind of like abusive way would continue with the like anytime I would be in trouble or something it would always be like well you know going back to well I, you know I'll tell your mom if you don't do this or that mm -hmm. or you know whatever so yeah. that continued on for the next you know few years um and I only just recently before I came on this podcast like told my mom that that had happened because she's going to be listening to this. So. Really? So that she has, that was the first time yeah. just recently? Yeah. Wow. And I felt really good actually to get it off my chest and let her know and that I'm that really happened. proud of you, first of all. Thank um, you. You're going to choke me up here a little <laughs> bit. But, you know, I, 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 I reference this a lot. You know, I, I, you know the Mr. Rogers uh, documentary, he said, you know, if you can mention it, you can manage it. And I thought how how profound that is. If we can start talking about the tough things we've been through, we can start to manage it. We can start processing through it. We can start. And you've not not that you haven't. Yeah. But I mean, I've I've had the privilege to work with you and and watch you go through some really hard processes and 
and uh, go through some really difficult, uncomfortable feelings um, because you were willing to mention the things you've been through. So yeah. I'm really proud of you. Thank you yeah. so much. Wow. And it does um, help. I can't even tell anyone like out there that, I mean, just getting certain things like out there, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't always about the addiction. You know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was a lot about the experience. And so, so that kind of opened the door, if, if you will, to like a bunch of other unhealthy relationships for you and then exactly. started drinking. Yes. Let's started drinking. Yeah. Um, and I think because of the situation with my stepdad kind of, I don't know, just sort of made it feel like this is how relationships are and this is how people treat people. But mm. um, so then that just sort of snowballed into, you know, having these other really, really toxic relationships with men, like from there on out, you know, and having really, really low, low self-esteem and yeah. really no self love, um, you know, all those things that kind of go along with that. But it was, I mean, one of my relationships when I was drinking really heavily and I probably started drinking like a little bit later in high school. Okay. Um, and not like super, you know, every day or anything like that, but it slowly progressed into a lot more, yeah. you know. Um, but I mean, I remember an incident where I was out in Wendover with, you know, my boyfriend at the time and we were really, really drunk and, um, he got just violent in the mm. hotel room and mm. actually like choked me to the point where I was throwing up. So, oh, wow. and then ended up like, you know, I, I don't know how I, if I got up or he stopped or something, but then he, you know, ran out of the hotel room or whatnot. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's just like things like that, that kept cropping up in my life. Like, and I'm thinking that these things are, are normal. And then talking to friends and things like that, they, they're, they're like, no, dude, that yeah. is not, it's not normal. that's not, you know, yeah. But that's just sort of what I felt like I deserved, I think, because wow. it had just, there was just no, there was just no self-esteem at all. So basically had a belief that uh, you weren't good enough. Exactly. And anything good in your life, you didn't deserve it or. Right. You know, we, we find that very common and I know, you know, she works for Wasatch now, by the way, and, <laughs> and you're getting your Sud C, yep. which is awesome, by the way. You're clean. You. I want to remind everyone, uh, as hard as this story is to hear, you're, you're doing great now, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, very, very common to hear that among people we work with is I just don't believe I'm good enough. Right. You know, how do you feel like that, that fueled kind of the behavior? Definitely yeah. for sure. And I used, you know, the drinking and everything as just a coping mechanism, of course, because when I was drinking, I would feel a little bit lighter, like the liquid courage, as they say. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I mean, it definitely just took me to another place, I would say, and yeah. got me out of my head a little bit. And I thought that that was, you know, yeah. that was fine. But, yeah. um, but it definitely fueled into something way, way darker, which turned into, like isolation, anxiety, yeah, depression. You, yeah, and to the point where you attempted to end your life. Talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Um, so there was, I was having a lot of just panic attacks and I was feeling really, really like I could not breathe. I couldn't get the pain like to stop i had this blockage like in my chest mm. and god now i'm like Ugh. <laughs> but um yeah. it sort of started with um i had gone through a breakup with uh with a boyfriend and i hadn't really been on my own at all and i was just sad and having a really really hard time and i um 
got just like really, really drunk. I mean, I don't even remember that night because I was blacked out completely. Mm. Um, but the next day I woke up from, you know, being really drunk and really, really sad. And I just felt like I couldn't go on. And so I was prescribed uh, Xanax from my um, doctor to take, you know, as a normal thing. And obviously I didn't disclose to him that I was drinking as heavily as I was. So... Um, I was taking one here and there during panic attacks and things like that, but one wasn't enough and then two wasn't and then three and so on and so forth. So, um, I just remember I was staying at my mom's house, watching her dogs while she was out of town. And I was in the midst of probably the worst panic attack I'd ever had. And I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't the pain was so heavy and so hard and my chest was so tight and I just wanted the pain to go away. Yeah. So I took the entire bottle of Xanax wow. and just wanted to go to sleep. And yeah. I would just wanted that like pain to just stop. Yeah. And I don't know, I always like think back and think like, was I trying to end my life or was I trying to just, you know, get some help? Like I, yeah. I try to rationalize it in some sort of way, which there's obviously no uh, rationalization with that. But, um, but it was just like so much pain that I couldn't like get yeah. to stop. Well, I've heard it uh, in therapy sometimes where, you know, we'll ask a client, well, how, how long did you want to be gone for or dead for? And it sounds like an insensitive question. And typically you never hear forever. It's usually, I just wanted what I was going through to go away. Yeah. You know, whether it was a week or two weeks or a month and, and maybe that's what was going on. You're like, I just, this is so heavy. I just don't want this anymore. Yeah. You know, if this was a way I wouldn't want to be doing this, you know? So, exactly. Yeah. And, um, but that really, you know, was sort of, which weirdly you would think that that would have changed everything and I would have gone straight the other way and been like, okay, I need help. I did ask for help from my mom um, and I got in to see a couple of therapists, but I continued to drink because, you know, it was just... I couldn't deal with that and that at the same time, I felt like, right. you know, there yeah. was just too much, too much. And I was still like in, now that I'm in the Sudsy program, I was definitely in chronic contemplation. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at you dropping know. some knowledge. <laughs> uh, for like a year. I mean, really, um, yeah. until the drinking got so severe where I was, you know, still, I was blacking out almost every single weekend. I was falling down. I I fell down. Um, I walked home from a bar one night to my house, and it was like winter, and mm. I slipped on ice and fell in the gutter. And luckily, my friend was at my house, and I don't even have any recollection of this, but he took a picture of me. I had blood coming all down my face. My eye was oh, totally oh. split open. He called an ambulance. Um, the next day I woke up and was like, what? You know? And I just remember him telling me, like, you don't remember anything. And, I mean, I could have died out in the gutter. Right. You know? Yeah. Just, it was really, really bad situation. And that's basically when I kind of decided that this is not, I can't, I can't live like this anymore. Yeah. Um, and probably about a month after that is when I reached out for help. I mean, and after ruining, I mean, I would go drunk to people's baby showers and, you know, birthday parties and Jeez. just ruin just things. Yeah. yeah. And I was out of control, belligerent, like completely. Um, and then still taking the Xanax on the side. Oh, like, boy. 
you know, together, that's yeah. not, that's a really scary combo, which I didn't even realize at the time at all. Yeah. Um, but I had a friend who uh, actually came through Wasatch. Yeah, Natalie, right? Yeah. yeah. And I just, I mean, I owe her my freaking life. But she um, told me, hey, like, there's this place. It's really great. Um, and, of course, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't need inpatient. That's crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, but she kind of set things up with, um, you know, the staff here and yeah. Decker and everything yeah. and called him. And he was like, well, she needs to go detox because I was taking the Xanax and, yeah. the, and drinking together. Yeah, that's a bad combo. And I remember the last day, like, getting completely hammered because I knew I was going to be coming in. And, I mean, I just had no idea the, the what I was doing to myself. Yeah. Um, but Natalie drove me to the, to the detox, and I went in there, and I was so scared. Well, you saw me when I came in, terrified. Oh, yeah, terrified. So scared. And my blood pressure was so high, and I had had so much to drink and had taken pills yeah. that then they – didn't admit me detox they made me go to the er and i was combative and mm -hmm. i was like if i don't get out of here soon i'm leaving and you know just being completely yeah. nuts and yeah. and i mean getting drunk that day was like the only way i thought i could get into it that i could yeah. actually do it you yeah, know right um but Anyway, so uh, my mom came up and sat with me in the ER for several hours. I remember sitting up in the bed and the, the lady is like, the nurse is like, you can get comfortable. And I'm like, no, I'm going, I'm going to detox or I'm leaving. Like, you know, but I wouldn't like lay down or anything. And, but I mean, I was in there for like six or yeah. seven hours. So yeah. eventually I laid down, I fell asleep. I remember my mom took a picture of me while I was in there and I was actually like asleep and I was like frowning, you know, I was mm. so sad yeah. and just the anxiety and like this pain and everything. It was just like all consuming. Yeah. I started being, a, you know, spending a lot of time where alone where I was isolating a lot and, you know, not reaching out to anyone beforehand. And it was like, I was almost like housebound, like crippled by my pain, you know? Wow. Um, but yeah, I got into detox and, um, you know, <laughs> that was a rough week, obviously yeah. coming down off of that stuff. Yeah. It's, you just really don't realize brutal. withdrawals until you have yeah, them. That's brutal. So bad. Um, but then, uh, I remember, Decker calling me up because he was going to pick me up from there. I spent six days there yeah. and he was like, I was still not convinced that I was, you know, by then I was feeling a little bit better. So I'll I be thought fine. I'll be good, you know? <laughs> and uh, basically I was like, he called me up and was like, Hey, like, blah, I'm going to pick you up um at this time and i'm like well you know actually i'm gonna run home really quick and like pack my things and he was basically like uh fo i will be there at 11. <laughs> like yeah, he yeah. was not letting me yeah. go home first yeah he says nope they can pack for you and i'll pick you up and um and then he picked me up and i came to wasatch and I was the most scared I've ever been in my entire life. Yeah. I, I want to talk about an experience <laughs> you and I've had together, <laughs> you know, and you probably know what I'm going to talk about, but you know, people won't believe this, but you were, you're very quiet. You were scared. You were shy. You were, and again, you were struggling, obviously. I mean, that yeah. makes, you know, it's pretty common when we see people come in like that. And, and I remember I was, we were, I was doing one of my groups with you guys and yeah, I can't, you might have to help me with the details, but I just remember I, I challenged you to share in alumni. Yes. And you were just like, there's just basically, there's just no way I'm not no. doing that. That's not me. I'm not, yeah. I can't get up and say anything. I got nothing good to say. And, and I'm like, no, yes, you do. And you know, we won't get into the words that we said, <laughs> but, yeah. but honestly, I was just basically challenging like, no, you're quit playing small. Yeah. Katie. 
Start playing big and share because when you share, you're going to grow. Right. And tell me how that went because from what I saw, that was almost like a turning point. It really was. Because, man, people who know you now, I mean, you're very outspoken. You speak your mind. Yeah. You're confident. you got a spring in your step. I know you're not perfect, but sure. it's the, the – the the transformation's been amazing it's crazy yeah i will never forget that day and it was um when we were in the group with you we <laughs> we had written a letter to ourselves like from our addiction or something yeah, uh-huh. and then i had just been sitting at one side of the room and you were like okay you get up first and then i got up and i was all like whoa like yeah. i hate this and you were like what no sit, stand back up and do this again you know yeah and so it was really like uh i didn't even like sharing with my housemates i mean that was what yeah. only like 12 or 13 people yeah. and then you said okay i'm gonna challenge you to stand up and you have to be the first person in alumni yep. to stand up and talk. And you said, I don't even care if you just say, you know, I'm I'm MF and sober and that's it. And then you sit down. So I was like, oh, my gosh, I almost threw up before that. <laughs> night. I was so scared. And I just remember. I had I sat in the front row and yeah, yeah. Uh, sat next to my buddy Daniel and good old Daniel, good old Daniel. Um, and seriously, like it came to the part where it's like, OK, it's time to do the open sharing. And I just like popped up and I literally said the exact words you told me to say. Yeah. I talked a little bit more. Yep. Um about I don't even remember because I think I was like blacked out because I was so scared but it was so cool because after that every single person like was there and yeah. supported me and they yeah. all got up after that yeah and it was so special and yeah. so cool yeah. and it just made like the whole meeting just so inspiring and like people told me that like because you you know really faced your fears it made me want to go and share yeah. and so then you know the next week went along and the next week and yeah so i didn't always go first but but yeah you know and again like i said at the very beginning of this that i think people are astonishing and that's astonishing and people might be listening well that's no big deal she just got up and shared no that was a huge turning point for your not just your recovery, but for your life. It really was. Because to see where you're at today, where here we are on this podcast. I know. Room, and you spoke at a junior high. Yep. And you're, I mean, you're making an impact on these kids' lives. And you're getting your Sud C. And you're working for Wasatch now. And this confidence that's just oozing from you. It's almost like it just had to, you needed to share one time to have it unleashed. <laughs> and it's like, watch out. Here comes Katie, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's so beautiful. I hope you know how how impressive that really, truly is, honestly. Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah. yeah. Because I think, you know, a lot of times, to be honest with you, Katie, people come through Wasatch or any treatment program, and they a lot of times, unfortunately, just go through the motions. Right. You know, they just, I'm going to do my time and I'm out of here. They're not really going, I'm going to change my life. Yes. I'm going to change. And that's what I started to see in you after that. Like you really started digging deep. You're like, I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to change these things that have held me back in my life. Is, yeah. Is that fair to say? That is so fair to say. Yeah. And I think that that's what is, you know, why I kind of wanted to be on your podcast too is that, yeah. I mean, I just feel so just like my entire life has changed in the past year yeah and in a way that i never thought was possible and <laughs> right. i mean it's just so crazy because before i never thought i could like go back to school and like you know stick with it and have a career plan and <laughs> you know i'm 44 so this was sort of like i had to say to myself this is this is your chance to really like change something. And I just had no idea that I could manifest this life for myself. Yeah. It's like so wow. amazing. You know, there's the day you were born, the day we're going to die. And then there's the day you decide to change your life. 
right? It's crazy. You know, there's a quote, I think it's by Mark Twain, that uh, goes like this. The, the two most important days of your life were the day you were born and the day you found out why. Like That's you, so powerful. Right? It's almost like you found your why. Like, think about it. Why did you have to go through 25 years of drinking, right? Uh, believing you weren't good enough, the abuse you had to go through, the unhealthy relationships? I mean, the list goes on, and I we could talk about all the details of that. But you often have to wonder, why does someone have to go through that? And I often will say, addiction and adversity is the wake-up call to your greatness. I love it. I mean, and it's so true. And now I can actually say, like, that you know, just how you've said a million times, like life happens for you, yeah. not to you. Yeah, right. And I always keep that in my mind because, you know, and forgiveness and the things that, that happen. I mean, some things aren't obviously good, but where I am now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. Wow. How cool is that? <laughs> so cool. Did you ever think you'd say that? Never. <laughs> <laughs> That's nuts. I know. It's, it's so nuts, crazy. but it's so beautiful, folks. And anyone out there hearing this, I mean, it doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. Right. We can change at any time and it's never too late. You know, we can, you know, you get to write the, the last several chap chapters of your book now and how you've overcome and now what you're going to go do to make an impact on people's lives. I'm so excited. So, um, we mentioned, obviously, you're getting your Sud C. You, yeah. you, you're currently working here at Wasatch. Mm -hmm. um, what What do you want to do? Like, if you think bigger picture, do you have other ideas and other thoughts of where you're heading, headed with all this? Yeah, um, I did get, uh, I, I'm getting the opportunity to do my internship with the Sud C down at day treatment with Wasatch. So I am so yeah. stoked to stay in the family. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I'm just really excited about, you know, helping people. And yeah. by the end of this fall, I'll have my license. If not, if when I pass the exam at the end of <laughs> <laughs> the fall semester. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I want to, you know, I want to be a counselor and hopefully, you know, go on to maybe do the BSW and the MSW possibly. Wow. Wow. Um, because at this point, I really feel like there's nothing that I can't do. It's it's amazing. Yeah. I I like have never thought I would ever say something like that before. But just that I really went through all of the stages of treatment, and like you said, you know, dig dig deep. Mm -hmm. Sean was my therapist, yeah. and what Shout an amazing Sean. love Sean. He's the best. Yeah. What an amazing person he is, and he really got me you know, to really open up and like you said, be vulnerable. Yeah. And that's like really what it took is to really get, get deep and yeah. let go of all of that stuff. And you Absolutely. know, what is amazing now. I do not have anxiety at all. Yeah. Like zero. Yeah. <laughs> it's like nuts. Right. Yeah. I can't you know, even believe um, it. And I want to, I'm glad you point that out because I think people think, well, no anxiety is constant. This and that I have found not only in my own life, but in the lives of the clients that I've seen over the last 34 years. Yeah. When we just start doing the right thing, most anxiety goes away. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. Because think about it. When we're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Think about that. No wonder we're anxious because we're deep down. It's like our soul's telling us, you're you're, what are you doing? Thing. You're doing the wrong thing. Knock this off. So you're true. always looking over your shoulder. Who did I lie to? Oh, I got to hide from the cops. Yeah. Oh, here's an unhealthy relationship. Oh, I got to go see that person again tonight. Yeah. Anxiety, anxiety is just off the charts. It just like snowballs But would too. you get it in line like you're doing? It doesn't surprise me. And I want people to hear this. Yeah. Your anxiety is not there because you're doing the right thing. Is that fair? That is so, that's like on point yeah. completely. Again, there's, you know, there's a time and place where we need medication for anxiety. I'm not against yeah. doing that, but I'm telling you, I've seen in my own life when I'm doing the right thing, I don't have anxiety. It's yeah. when I'm being a little shady here and exactly. hiding this and doing that or then I'm like, oh, and then my I'm just feeling anxious. Well, yeah. Todd, get your life in line, darn it. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, I want to ask, what, what does your mom think of all this? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> she is like, 
I swear almost every day she probably tells me how much, how proud she is of me. She can't even believe where I've come. She, you know, your, your mom, they, they always have such like high hopes for you. Sure. Yeah. And she's always been on my side. She was an amazing support and my sister as well. Um, you know, when I was through Wasatch, but even before and everything, um, but I think that she just, she's like in, she can't believe it. I mean, yeah, I she's bet. just like. Yeah, she's got to be she, very happy She's for you. so happy. She tells me like constantly. Sometimes I'm like, okay, enough is enough. You're proud. I get it. You know, but, <laughs> but she just can't even believe it. And she just says, you're just, you, you are, you know, you're look what you've done with your life. Like mm. I want you to really believe, look at this, like yeah. look how, look where you've come and it that. feels really good. That's you cool. know, well, what, what do you love most about your life right now? Um, Oh my God. So many things. It's, it's like, um, I love that I went through the entire program and did, you know, from start to finish, mm -hmm. I did date, uh, inpatient then day treatment then IOP I'm currently in GOP and um I'm working at Wasatch I love working here I just like yeah. I have never loved a job in my entire life you know and <laughs> this is like I come to work and I'm just like this is not even like work I it is just so rewarding yeah. and to see like you know, clients sort of like come on and I remember how that felt. Right. Yeah. It just like I mean, sometimes I just cry <laughs> because it's just so amazing to yeah. to see the transformation and how much work people are putting in and really trying to get their lives back together. And I just resonate with that so much that yeah. it makes me so excited. Um and then <laughs> I'm just so so stoked that I like told myself that I would get back into school and I would do this program and it's like it's really happening and I just feel like I have I have success in my life as far as you know that I'm on a path for once because yeah. before I was just I never had any passion for anything I never had any drive I you know, I I went to school before, but I just went through the motions. Yeah. I didn't really care. And now yeah. I like care and I want to learn and, yeah. you know, and so at cool. the end of it, it's going to turn into where I'm going to be able to turn around and, you know, share my story and also yeah. help somebody else that's for sure that's in, you know, pain or in trouble. And that is like just amazing to me yeah. it makes me so excited to <laughs> for what the future holds yeah it's inspiring yeah it's inspiring to watch well if there's someone listening to your voice right now who's in a dark place they're struggling they're not sure what to do what would you tell that one person right now um i have i would say probably again like you said it's never too late you know, I mean, you're never too old. Um, also, I was thinking about this kind of like this football analogy where you, you know, you eventually want to get a touchdown. But what you really need to do is just move the chains a little bit at a time. Mm. And for me, that was sort of really helpful because when I look at the big picture, sometimes I get overwhelmed, but if I just take one little piece at a time, yeah. then it all sort of, then I can check those things off the list, you know, one, yeah. one small piece at a time. Love that. So great advice. Thank you. So good. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I, I think the world of you, I love you. I'm so happy for you to watch you, to see you come into work here and just smiling and beaming and talking our ears off and just, <laughs> a, just this confident happy person <laughs> it is just it just that's why i love doing what i do and been doing this for a long time and to see success stories such as yourself you know because it's not about stopping the drugs and the alcohol 
obviously that's a big part of it. But what it's more so about finding joy again in your life. So and true. that's what I see with you. you. You've got joy again, right? Because I never you can, even knew that existed. Right? And it's, you know, we can stop drinking and doing drugs, yeah. but if we're not experiencing joy, it's almost like, what's the point? Right. So I love that you have embraced that and you're feeling it and you're experiencing it because when you have joy, there's no there's no reason to go put, uh, you know, poison in your body anymore. That's right. Right? Exactly. You know? I love sobriety, honestly. Uh, it's the best. It really is. It's the best. Well, um, if someone wanted to reach out to you, Katie, and, you know, tell you thanks or, you know, get to know you better or to follow you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Um, I mean, email or... Um, yeah. Do you, do you, are you comfortable or, sharing your email? Of course. Yeah. yeah. What is it? It's uh, Katie, K-A-T-I-E dot Harrison, H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N, 1979 at gmail.com or um, on Instagram is... Um, Katie S L C eight oh one. Eight oh one. Yeah. Well I'll put those links in the show notes so people can yeah. get right to it when we go live and Thank you they so can reach much, out Todd. to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being on the show today. This is amazing. I was I feel very honored to be here. Yeah. You you are an inspiration to <laughs> so many people, Thank including you. myself. Thank you. That means a lot. Thanks. No, I'm blessed to be a part, a small part at times just of your journey and to see where you're at. It's awesome. You are, you are, and I use your quotes all over the place, so <laughs> you're out there. Yeah, it's I cool. popped out of bed like a piece of toast this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I put in my declaration statement years and years ago that people would quote me. Oh, cool. And to hear you say that, that's a, one of the best compliments I could ever get, so thank you. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. You're amazing. Thank you. Well, there you go. People are astonishing, and so is Katie. <laughs> What a wonderful, you know, at times traumatic story, but to see where she's at today, folks. If you think you can't overcome your hard life, think again, because Katie's living proof of that. Thanks again to my sponsors. Thank you once again for tuning in. If you have a loved one who's struggling, you're not sure how to break the ice, give them a link to this episode. It will break the ice and you can follow back up with them and ask them, what did they think of Katie's story? It really is a beautiful way to to start get a conversation going if you're not sure how to do it. So I love you guys. Katie, one last thank you to you. You're the best. And until next time, okay? Thank you. All right. Love you guys. <laughs>